Hello and welcome to episode 102. And if anybody's been following these videos, um, one of the things that I've been doing over the past week or so is removing the PC from my recording studio back at home and replacing it with a Mac. And I guess a lot of people are probably in the same boat. Um, I've been a PC user for recording for a pretty long time now. And I started buying computers made by the Carillon firm in London. And they were lovely 19 inch rack computers. And basically there was a really nice cast front sort of case. And they were put inside whatever computer you wanted. And I think that must go back to around about the late 90s. So I think they've gone bust at one point and they've resurrected themselves and they're going again. Um, but over the years, uh, I've managed to have about five or six of these things. And every time the computers got old, I would sort of replace the guts of the oldest one with a new motherboard, memory, processor, power supplies, all that sort of stuff. And... I'd keep upgrading the internals and keep the actual machines because they were absolutely wonderful. And one of the great things that they started out with were actually buttons that you could fit to the front of the computer that had play, stop, rewind, record. And they were actually uh, little MIDI units made by the Philip Reese company, I think, which again, I think they disappeared after a while. So although I'd actually got these computers that had got these lovely control panels on, uh, the drivers and things for them gradually vanished. And so I've still got the rack mount with that on the front, but I've never actually managed to get those buttons to work for probably well over 15 years now. There's a little group of people I know who are still trying to keep them going, but they're, they're just so old. They just don't realistically work with modern gear. I'm sure clever people could write drivers for them, but I'm not one of those. Um, but I keep the computers. So the computers themselves, you know, I mean, they probably weigh around about 10 kilos just for the actual box without any things inside it. So once you start to put bits in, they're seriously heavy. But they're steel construction. They've got an aluminium front panel. Uh, they're really tough. I've put them in road cases. I've taken them out on the road for live shows and things like that. And they've been pretty good. But things move on and I decided to swap the last one that's in my studio at home for a Mac. I went for a Mac Mini, uh, the M2 Pro version. I looked at all the stuff on the internet, read, read the blurb, uh, went on YouTube, looked at people's comments about them. And of course, there are always some saying they're dreadful things and there are others saying that they're a waste of money and they don't go any faster than some of the other ones. And, you know, the usual style of um, comments that you get and you sort of pick the bones out of it and make a decision. And so I decided for music, I would go with that particular machine. Um, I don't regret it. I mean, it's it's come. The only annoying thing is that there are some things I forgot. Now, if you're doing this PC to Mac route, some of these things are quite important. Not everything that you already own will work with them. And realistically, that's not just hardware, which I'll get onto in a moment, but of course it's crucially the software. And if you're like me and you've collected bits and pieces over the years and kept them going, do you remember back to when we had sort of 32-bit plugins? And then Cubase, which is the one I use, suddenly decided that they weren't going to support 32-bit plugins anymore. So all the nice sort of uh, MIDI stuff that I'd got, some synths, uh, an, an organ emulation, things like that, that really sounded good, I suddenly couldn't use. Well, there was a sort of solution, bridging software. So basically, uh, you put all of the 32-bit DLL files in a little sort of folder, and then this bridging software convinced the computer that they were 64-bit and they carried on working. Well, I can't make that work, of course, on the Mac. So I do have a shortage of the old stuff. 
I had some old Korg stuff, some old Roland stuff, um, you know, things that I didn't use like every day, but they were just useful to have. And I've not managed to get those things working. I mean, maybe I will, but I'll have to persevere. Um, a few of the other things that I had working within contact won't work anymore. Um, they appear in the files, they, they, they're they there, they sort of load up, but nothing happens. Um, nothing crucial. So my contact stuff, so my contact libraries, uh, the contact ones using the, the native instrument stuff, and also some of the Spitfire stuff that runs within contact, they all work absolutely fine. And all of the Spitfire stuff, and I'm a great lover of Spitfire audio, and all the stuff that I've got from them, uh, that's happily running on the Mac. So I've probably got about 95% of my sort of day-to-day -day sounds running. Pretty difficult to get most of it authorised because while Spitfire are quite happy for you to download it and their activation manager seems to work pretty flawlessly, um, some of the others require things that I just can't find. Uh, so some of them are asking for serial numbers and I don't know where they are. I mean, I'm not very organised, so the serial numbers have gone. So I've lost quite a lot of those until I can dig up old emails that have got the authorization numbers in. I mean, my problem, you know, my, my downfall really was whenever I sort of typed in an authorization number and it worked, I didn't really bother to sort of archive that email that had the number in. So it's all my fault. But realistically, I've now got the Mac Mini up and running and I can record on it. I can do everything I need to do in it. And I've just lost a few sounds. Now, the workflow that I use for a lot of the projects is I record them all in Cubase. And then when Cubase has dumped me out a WAV file with the finished thing, I put it into what was Sony SoundForge. I mean, SoundForge is now part of the Magics group. Um, so SoundForge always worked nicely for me. I don't think it was any better than Adobe Audition or any of the other sort of editing things, but it worked nicely for me and it did some of the things that I do every day quite well. It was also quite easy to put metadata into files and things. That was quite simple. Just type a few things in and it would save it as part of the file. And it didn't occur to me at all that SoundForge doesn't work on Macs. It did work on Macs. It worked on uh, Macs perfectly well up to High Sierra uh, when Sony had it. And so with Sony, there was a PC version and there was a, a Mac version. And then once uh, Sony got rid of SoundForge and it tra uh, translated across to the Magic's organisation, they didn't support Mac at all. So it was a bit of a shock to get the email back from them saying, well, the reason you can't find the Mac download is because there isn't one. Um, and I think they actually said, really sorry for the inconvenience. Um, well, the inconvenience really is that I was on SoundForge version 16 um, having started when it was probably in the 8s and 9s. And uh, I only upgraded, as in paid money, um, back in February this year. So while I can put SoundForge on a PC, annoyingly, the studio back home is now Mac, and the video studio here is also Mac. Editing... Uh, I still do on a PC, but that's uh, the only place that I could put Sony SoundForge. And realistically, when I'm doing video editing, I use Adobe Audition because it integrates really well with Premiere. So in Premiere, I can look at an audio line, take that track, right click, and it says edit in Adobe Audition. I can put it in, into Audition. I can do the tweaking I want close it on Audition and it reappears back in Premiere and it's all updated and all done. Um, SoundForge would mean rendering it out, rendering it back in again, um, and that would mess up things like sync and stuff like that. So I guess I just have to forget about SoundForge, which is a bit of a shame. Now, 
going back to the hardware side of things, in my studio back home, I was quite happy with the Presonus Firepod that I got. It's an FP10. It's quite old, elderly, call it what you like. But it's got the sockets on the front, which is nice. It's also got fairly clean preamps, so I like that. So I sort of got sort of settled down with it and I actually quite liked it. Um, I just couldn't get it to work with a Mac. Um, there's two sides. Uh, the first problem I had was, of course, that it uses the full size large firewire connector. So to get that into the Thunderbird socket on the Mac Mini meant three adapters. Um, and while it sort of appears to work and the Mac can see it, um, it doesn't. So the Mac cannot seem to talk to it, uh, not the Mac Mini. Now, oddly, I brought the Presonus from home with the Mac Mini and I've stuck it in the studio here. I've swapped the unit that was in this rack here for the Presonus that was in my home studio. Um, and the computer here is um, a fairly elderly iMac. Um, I think it's 2018 vintage, 2019 maybe. Um, and it's got a socket on the back, um, which means I can remove one of those adapters. And basically it's the, the modern current one to the previous version one. Um, so instead of being the, um, the, th the Thunderbird style USB-C size type connector, it's the older, the chunkier one with a little slot in it. Um, and I plugged the Presonus into that this morning. It picked it up straight away and Cubase is running on this computer here, perfectly happily with the Presonus Firepod. So I've sort of got ups and downs. Uh, I could still use that here and it's it's just going to live here working in this system here. And the Lexicon Omega that was here that I had before, the only reason that was here on the Mac was again because drivers were stopped for that. And despite the fact that I quite liked it as an interface and it sounded nice, um, I couldn't use it on a PC. There's no way I could actually make it talk the drivers in terms of you know old products with the Lexicon Amiga were discontinued and so that was that. So this sort of swapping from computer to computer is nowhere near as trouble free as I thought it was going to. And realistically it's taken me getting on for a week. The worst bit, the absolute worst bit was that the libraries for the contact and the libraries for Spitfire, despite having nice little buttons that say repair, um, they don't. Um, what actually happened was, of course, the locations are different. The places that the files are being stored is different. Um, so having all of the files I thought safe on my drive uh, wasn't any good. Uh, I got a couple of drives in the, in, with the machine can access that's got all the um, sample libraries on. And I assumed I could just click on a repair button, it would find the new location, install them. No, I had to download every single thing again. And I've got a fairly fast fibre connection, but it still took forever. So despite having, you know, probably three terabytes or so of files sitting there perfectly happily on a hard drive, um, I couldn't make them actually do that and lock in together. So really all of them, it was a reset, a re-download uh, and saving it in the same place. And it actually worked. Um, no bother with the actual sort of authorization system, both the contact native instrument stuff and the Spitfire worked absolutely fine. I did have a bit of a problem with Garatan. Um, I've got some older sample libraries. They are 64-bit, um, but I've got um, one which is really nice. It's a sort of jazz band style thing, so it's lighter instruments. And I've got an orchestral one of theirs. 
and neither of those are supported on the Mac Silicon. Um, the Mac, if you run it in Rosetta mode, which is where it sort of essentially uses the old system rather than the Silicon dedicated one, um, Rosetta will run those ARIA plugins from Garatan, but they don't seem to work on the Silicon. It doesn't work. So um, I have lost them. Annoyingly, they come up in the list. So you can actually see them in the list, but you can't load that into Cubase. It, it just doesn't seem to want to work. So that's one thing I have lost, the Garatan. Um, I don't know. Maybe I could perhaps download those again. I haven't tried because they're not things that I use that often. So I've uh, had to do that. Cubase is actually pretty nice for all this because it does allow you to authorise things on three computers. And like Adobe, you can have for any three computers... So if I come down here and I want to use something um, and it's sitting on my MacBook at home and it's sitting on the studio computer and it's somewhere else, all I have to do is deauthorize one of those and reauthorize it on this one. And that seems to work quite smoothly. So as long as you've got an internet connection, uh, Adobe and Steinberg are quite happy for you to drop things, take on new ones, drop them off again and swap things around, which is quite nice. So... I'm not moaning at all at um, Native Instruments or Cubase. Um, Steinberg have done a pretty decent job on allowing me to do everything I wanted. But the time involved is dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. Uh, for those of you that run uh, Cubase, the later version to Cubase now use uh, a system very similar to Adobe's where authorization is done online and there's an activation manager and, and it, it works fine. Um, I had a little bit of trouble with the Mac Mini and old Cubase dongles. I've still got two USB dongles for Cubase that have got some of the older things. I think Hypersonic is on one of them. Uh, that doesn't work. It's too old now. Um, but there's other things on the e-license. There are a couple of other little bits of software I've got. And it seemed a little bit finicky about which of the USB sockets I used. It didn't work in one but it did work in another. Um, but they're probably fairly old technology now, aren't they? Sort of USB dongles. So um, the new licensing system is much better. I heard people sort of moaning about it, but I've got nothing but praise. It works flawlessly for me, working across two different locations and one, two, three Macs and a PC. So I can uh, go from one to the other without any bother. So if any of this is helpful, if you're thinking about migrating from a PC to a Mac, uh, just keep some of these things in mind. It isn't as seamless as you might think. Everything's available to download. It just takes such a long time to do. And you will lose a few of your old bits of software. If I find a workaround, these things, and I can manage to get some of the old stuff working, I'll let you know. But if it's not reasonably modern vintage, you're going to struggle a little bit because they just, the system isn't designed to cope with plug-in systems from five years plus. And of course, if, like me, you're a, an ex-Sony Soundforge person, uh, Magix can't help you with a Mac. So that's worth mentioning because I really didn't know that. I'd never noticed that there were no Mac versions available. Because if you're a PC user, you don't get a chance. You don't bother to look at the Mac stuff, do you? So that's what I did. So there we go. It's not exactly pain-free, but that's my pathway through it so far. Anyway, if it's been at all useful, just uh, subscribe. Give me a thumbs up. Then I'll know that you actually liked it and you, you don't mind these sort of talky videos. And I'll do some more. Anyway, see you on the next one. Look after yourselves. Take care.